I literally just met one of the, like, second most important people in the ranks of the government. Um, and now I'm going to talk about how I wish I knew how dragons had sex. So this is great. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to another episode of Midlight Crisis, a real podcast hosted by three grown-up biologists revisiting books from our teens, and it's totally cool. I am one of your hosts, Sophie, and I have a randomly generated fantasy name today. It's it's just a good little fantasy name, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Maybe in Redwall fantasy? Oh. We'll see. My name is Fayani Almaid. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, Fanny? yeah. Fanny oh, yeah, I like Alamed. it. It's cute. Anyway, that's me. Who are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> My name's Sam, but today you can call me Bella Key Tree Told. Whoa! Oh, yeah? <laughs> Dang, yeah. Tree Told. Tree. What did you? What did you tell them? <laughs> oh, I was thinking they told you something. Oh, what did they tell and- you? It told me that uh, climate change is real, you stupid humans. What the f*** are you doing? That's great. Okay. <laughs> they do have a good point. They yeah. do have a good point. Stop cutting us down. Oh. <laughs> we sequester Gerben. What are you doing? <laughs> I love when everyone all is like, man, if only science could find a way to sequester carbon. And then scientists are like, yeah, we have this thing. It's uh-huh. renewable and just sequesters a lot of carbon. Uh-huh. It's called a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, maybe, maybe just... like stop actively killing whales because they also sequester a lot of carbon and I'm definitely not salty that the North Atlantic right whale population keeps decreasing. Mm-hmm. Stop running over whales with your boats. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. They're also pretty salty because they're marine mammals. Yeah. <laughs> we have that in common. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> anyway. Who are you, Hannah? <laughs> My name is Hannah, but for the purposes of this podcast, you can call me Sam's Blood Builder. Oh, <laughs> you build my blood? <laughs> yep. Dang. Yep. Why does my blood need to be built? Uh, I think, you know what? Uh, I don't think this is my name. I think this is your mother's name. <laughs> Sam's oh, God. Blood Builder. <laughs> oh. 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 oh, no. Oh. Or else Hannah's just like, making you a lot of like iron rich meals Mm. Mm. there we go to beef up your own blood yeah she's like damn i'm just worried about your iron levels so here's some raw meat (laughs) here eat some liver (laughs) yeah chill really that's what i was trying to do today because i accidentally undercooked our burgers (laughs) (laughs) loki just trying to boost my iron yeah just trying to get this blood in you (laughs) <laughs> wait are you trying to make me a vampire whoops I'm gonna say. <laughs> did you put a parasite in our burgers you know that is the first thing I thought of <laughs> like dang <laughs> undercooking these burgers we're gonna get parasites oh my god I okay, which can one. we talk about Aragon instead of this sure I'm sure yep. I'll be able to bring parasites up there too but no you can't <laughs> yeah it's we illegal. uh <laughs> it's not Yet. No one's <laughs> made it a law. <laughs> Listen, I got certified today as a uh, law enforcer mm-hmm. <laughs> in general terms. Sure. So I'm Someone gonna, has to make I'm the law, though. <laughs> Don't worry. We spent all three days talking to a lawyer. <laughs> I'm outside your jurisdiction. <laughs> How about... Uh, we go into the two chapters we read this week, which are two chapters of the book Aragon. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yep. Chapter 15, called A Saddle Making. So, as the title suggests, Brahm and Aragon make a saddle for Sephira. We wow. learn that there are two types of dragon saddles, but given their time and resources, they can only make the less comfortable one. From there, Brom decides they need horses, preventing Aragon from being a dumb 15-year-old boy going after the resort carelessly, and so they agree to go get horses the next day. Aragon, Aragon, Aragon says uh-huh. stealing is bad, and the chapter ends with them once again <laughs> saying goodnight. 
<laughs> wow. Good night, uh-huh. world. Well, in the next chapter, Theron's Ford, Bram and Aragon wake up in the little secret meadow, and they set out on their revenge quest. Bram spices up the journey by talking about dragons, which we will certainly get into later. And Aragon uh, straps the new saddle and the sword Zarak onto Saphira because, quote, in his hands, it would be no better than a club. Then Brom challenges him to a sparring match with wooden practice swords. And for some reason, Aragon's thought is, I'm going to be able to kick this old man's ass. <laughs> Spoiler, he does not. And <laughs> Saphira laughs at him for getting beaten up by an old man. Uh, anyway, shortly thereafter, they arrive in Theronsford, where they buy horses with money that Brom got by picking pockets. The horses are a spirited bay that Aragon names Kadok after his grandfather, and a very majestic, very special white horse called Snowfire, not Shadowfax. Completely different. <laughs> totally, completely different. It's a very different situation. <laughs> Thus behorsed, they leave Thernsford, passing the mountain Utgard, and coming to the end of the valley that looks so looks out. Oh, did you hear that? No Scotian in there. Holy oh, shit! Oh, I did. <laughs> That looks out over a huge grassy plain. Then, wait for it, they make camp for the night. (laughs) (laughs) They go to sleep. They go Uh, to bed. (laughs) They go to bed. Okay, no, that chapter was different, though, because Aragon goes to bed in the middle of it. He does. And then goes to bed again at the end. Yes. I definitely thought the first time he went to sleep, because the way it is on my computer, I thought that was like the chapter end, and then I kept going, and I was like, oh, oh, maybe maybe we're gonna get like a midday stop, but he still ended the chapter at night. At like, bedtime. Yeah, he night, still yeah. did it at a bedtime. Yeah. Oh, I love this book. It's, it's great. So I love this. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so great. fun now that we've noticed it. Oh my god. <laughs> At first it annoyed me, and now it's hilarious every time yeah. it happens. Now it's yeah. the best possible thing. <laughs> oh, great. I also just love Aragon being like, stealing is bad. I'm not right? gonna do it. Anyway, yeah. let's go murder some people. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, especially when it's like, I'm going to make a saddle with this stolen leather. Yeah. But stealing is wrong. It's like, what's your... <laughs> But okay. you you stole the leather. You just, uh-huh. you just did a steal. Stealing stuff is fine. Stealing money is wrong. Right. Obviously. Unless Brom does it from a guy who stole it from them first. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Aragon has a very strong and somewhat confusing moral code. Yeah. But one of the things that uh, I found delightful about the second chapter is something we learn indirectly about Aragon. Which is when Brom beats his ass with a wooden sword. <laughs> Sephira lets out what Aragon describes as a long coughing growl and curls her lip. And he's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Until he realizes that she's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Which to me indicates that Aragon is so humorless that in the like three or four months <laughs> since Sephira's hatched, he has never once said anything funny enough to make her laugh. <laughs> I mean, I like, it oh checks. God. It does. That's a great point. <laughs> Aragon is an incredibly serious person. <laughs> yeah. He's no too here. serious for he's a 15 so year old boy. Listen, he's got the weight of the world on his tiny teenage shoulders. Yeah. Does he know that yet, though, still? I don't Who know. Knows? Maybe. Hmm. I mean, his mother's dead and his father abandoned him, and he thinks about it in the mornings, so I'd probably. Oh, be, I like, forgot kind about of that. Too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And his uncle died. And his uncle died. <laughs> and his cousin's gone. <laughs> his cousin's gone, but when they get to Theron's Ford, Aragon doesn't want to see him. Aww. Presumably because he doesn't want to have to, you know, face up to what happened to Garo. <laughs> to death. Yeah. Uh. Dang. Mm. I found it weird. I don't know if anyone else noticed this. But, like, Mm -hmm. I've been trying to put my finger on why, like, every time Brom says something, I find it, like, jarring. Like, I don't know, there there was something about, like, the way his, like, speaking cadence was, like, written. It doesn't feel like an older person who is talking. Oh. Oh, really? Like, every time he speaks, I'm like, man, I just, like, this doesn't seem like someone who's old. Like, it seems like someone who's closer to Aragon's age. Mm. and i think it's because like i was trying to figure it out in these chapters i did not 
go back and read any other chapters. <laughs> but I think it's because like when he's sounding like like he's talking about the history of dragons or whatever and like sounding like this like elder knowledgeable person, he like has a certain way of speaking and doesn't use any contractions. And then like oh. he'll be talking to Aragon mm. and just there'll be a bunch of contractions and I'm like, what the I don't know that there's like consistency in the way that he's talking in the book. And that's why mm. it keeps throwing me off. <laughs> Yeah, that could be it. Yeah, I didn't notice that at all. I actually have the complete opposite because, like, I felt like the way he's characterized is like that crazy old man kind of. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. there's, that, there's that trope in fantasy where, like, there's the old wizard that the chosen one has to go find, and like the wizard ends up being like kooky and a little bit out there and kind of all over the place. Like yeah, maybe Yoda. Yoda. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, and there's Gandalf, and then there's another one. Um, Obi Wan. Obi Wan. I'm thinking of. I think it's called Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. But the character in that is like the exact epitome of how I envision Brom. He's just like crazy wizard man. Yeah. So that's kind of like how I always interpreted it. Okay. But I also didn't. I don't know. I didn't pay too much attention to the language of it all. I was just like, oh, okay, this guy's insane. Cool, love it here for it yeah i could just be like having a weird time quite honestly <laughs> well i think that's, <laughs> that's another fair. interesting example of how even the three of us who you know read similar things and have reasonably mm. similar experiences can interpret something totally differently because yeah. the thought i had while reading these chapters was like man aragon talks like an old person yeah like the exact opposite <laughs> <laughs> well yeah aragon talks like an old person and brahm doesn't <laughs> I just got it that Aragorn was like a sullen, sad, emo teenager and just was like trying to talk like he's uh, above his age. Yeah. Honestly, he's probably <laughs> picked it up from Garo, who also seemed yeah. like a very true kind of like hard. <laughs> well, do we all remember sort of his fellow? speech? Oh, my God. Do we remember that speech? Because uh, yes, a good, I, speech. Oh, good speech. A good but speech. But that I think is, I think that sums it up well. Yes. Yeah, like, I'm just gonna pick out the, like, one sentence that threw me off. Because, like, right before, Brahm says, like, Aragon, I must apologize about how events have turned out. I never wished for this to happen. Your family did not deserve such a tragedy. And so, like, all of that is, like, sort of how you expect, like, you know, mm -hmm. he's, like, wow, dramatic. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the very next line he says, it'll be safer if we stay together. And it's just, like, that doesn't, oh, like, yeah. that doesn't sound like the way <laughs> anyway doesn't matter yeah. it doesn't matter <laughs> i'm just interested to see if it continues <laughs> yeah that is interesting yeah yeah i find i don't tend to notice character voice a lot but it is something that like a lot of authors will deliberately include uh, one of the most recent books i read that i'm thinking of at the moment is shorefall yeah mm -hmm. by robert jackson bennett and several of the characters have, like, very distinct speaking styles. Not all of them, but, like, every time the character Clef is talking, you're like, oh, this is Clef. Like, mm -hmm. this is how Clef talks. And that is something that I think a lot of authors at least try to include consistently, even if it's not as distinct of a voice as Clef or, like, a, a, you mentioned the lack of contractions. So I'm also thinking about the Del Toro Quest books where, like, Barda has a very kind of yeah. <laughs> specific mm -hmm. voice. So now that you've brought that to my attention, I'm also very interested to see how consistent that voice is. And like, now that you mentioned the like, oh, well, he's like in this archetype of the kind of weird old man that the main character has to go talk to. It's like, yeah. honestly, that could kind of be a choice, right? But mm -hmm. it doesn't really like lean into it. Yeah. But it could just be that like, oh, when he's being serious, he speaks in like a certain way. And then when he's just like, talking he talks a different way you know to try and not on purpose but like that's just the character yeah. so yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. see it's an interesting observation for sure yeah shall we talk about the elephant in the room e please yes <laughs> <laughs> please perhaps the dragon in the room <laughs> perhaps the dragon in the room <laughs> Christopher is... Paolini did not give me enough information <laughs> <laughs> I'm very I... upset <laughs> cannot believe he just glosses over all of it all of it <laughs> all of it 
he just says that Brom explained how dragons mate and then continues from there. And it's like, wow, <laughs> rude. How uh-huh. dare he? <laughs> you have plotted out how fast it takes a dragon to grow, but you can't explain at 15 how dragons have sex. <laughs> He also <laughs> did not explain, like, the next paragraph after that is about basically dragon husbandry. And again, just, like, glosses yeah. over it. Yeah. Like, how dare you? He just says, so the rude. best way to, like, clean the scales and care for the claws. And I'm like, okay, and it is. What? And it is. Please. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and that section, I loved the, the line, some plants could heal their sicknesses while others would make them ill. Like, no shit. Yeah. No shit. Right? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just a bunch of super obvious things without him actually giving any details and i'm just like you've given us so much detail before how dare you just gloss over this i understand <laughs> the dragon mating thing okay i get it it's a children's book like fine yeah. fair gloss over it but don't gloss over how dragon husbandry works. I want all you. the details. I want to know. <laughs> I'm assuming we'll get more details on that. Possibly. Yeah, later. as we learn more about like the dragon riders, I feel like yeah. we'll probably get more information about how they took care of the dragons. But I yeah. guess we'll, we'll see. I just feel like there was so much information packed into like legitimately just two paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, so much of it just leads to so many more questions. <laughs> yes. The only real information we get about the dragon sex issue is that a full-grown dragon, which we've established is about six months old, uh, mm-hmm. can go for months without food, unless mm-hmm. it's mating season, in which case they need to eat at least once a week. So clearly, whatever they're doing is extremely energetically expensive. Are they, like, yeah. sand tiger sharks? Maybe, but it's like they're requiring like eight times more calories than usual. What are they doing? <laughs> right, which is also wild because like we've equated them to like dinosaurs a little bit, right? Yeah. And dinosaurs as like a large, active, warm-blooded reptile, they mm-hmm. can't like normal reptiles can go a very long time without food, but like dinosaurs could not. Like as soon as you're warm-blooded, you can't mm-hmm. go that long without food. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Well, especially if you're doing something like flying. Yeah. Which we've mentioned before. It's such an energetically expensive activity that a flying animal that has like the slightest evolutionary reason to stop flying will. Yeah. So <sighs> like, I'm so I'm d- curious how they can sustain themselves for so long. Unless they're like eating magic. <laughs> like this implies oh. that Allegasia has like a lean season. You yes, know? it does. Because then, like, the dragons had to adapt to a very long period of time without food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's also related to something we get about the eggs, which we'll get into once we're done talking about this food thing. Yeah. Yeah, that is an interesting implication. Yeah. But if they're, I wonder if they do, like, aerial stunts like birds That's do. That's what I was thinking. Ooh, right? Yeah. Like, like that, that maybe is why they have to eat a lot but also every week is not that often no again like pterosaurs the flying reptiles and like large the flying dinosaurs yeah nope no 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 <laughs> still not dinosaurs um <laughs> but like t-rex and stuff like they had to eat every day <laughs> like hmm. probably a significant portion of their body weight so they must have extremely efficient metabolisms but they're also huge. Yeah. Or, or is it that they have extremely vigorous mating rituals and they have to eat like right after it to like regain that energy and then they can't like recharge and mate again for another week. Ugh, so like recharge. I don't know. <laughs> Every week is like the dragon also refractory not- period. Yeah. <laughs> no. Nope. That's what I was like what if <laughs> What if the the female dragon has to grow an, another egg and she's only fertile once a week? It could be that. I was definitely I mean, imagine like because they clearly have some kind of very energetic sexual activity. <laughs> I immediately went to a mate competition 
which is oh, usually true, among yeah. males because if you're a female who has to put a lot of energy into growing a large baby like a human or a deer or something you want the best possible mate to provide your offspring with like the best possible chance yeah which is why you get things like the rut and deer and that is an extremely energetically expensive and very dangerous activity for the male deer and presumably they have to eat more i don't actually know that detail of it yeah so like dragon fighting do the male well, dragons fight for the females well so that's the other like they are sentient yeah so like yeah it could just be that like physiologically like building eggs is like so energetically expensive that the females need to eat extremely yeah. often which means like maybe maybe it's like mate feeding right like where mm. the partner has to like go hunt mm -hmm. to go to get food and then they're just eating way more man i yeah. would love for a partner to bring me food when i'm hungry and ovulating <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> the dang dream. that sounds nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah also like when it, like yeah because when is a dragon sedentary like they fly what the hell like yeah. what are they doing <laughs> maybe like when they get older they slow down yes I, I guess we did forget to mention specifically that they can go months without eating if they're quote-unquote sedentary but, like, yeah you, that's what makes me think there's, like, a hibernation period. Oh, see, I was definitely taking that in a direction I think we talked about several episodes ago. Where it's like, does that imply that there is a culture where a dragon can be sedentary for that long and, like, some other dragon will take care of it and bring it food so it can be sedentary? I guess. That's nothing. Probably. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe that's when they're, like, brooding an egg or something. Oh, yeah. Although they don't have to brood their eggs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. But maybe like because so it says specifically here that like by the time the egg is like laid, the baby inside is already fully developed. Yeah. Yeah. So like the egg is sort of unnecessary for mm -hmm. the purpose that eggs are normally necessary, which is to like recreate an internal environment that the baby can finish like cooking at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great so like but then they yeah have this egg with a fully formed baby already inside that just waits to hatch in i guess we've decided magical stasis yeah yeah so like i guess maybe the full-grown dragon if like it's pregnant would be sedentary because it's probably a while yeah i would assume probably. it has to have a reasonably long gestation yeah. time right to build right. a whole dragon. Right. Like, it takes nine months to build a human, and humans are bored, like, wildly neo neotenous. Wildly new, yeah. Is that how you pronounce that? It doesn't matter. Neo neotenic? Neotenic? Whatever. The one where you're yeah. born before you're fully developed, like a kangaroo yeah. or a human. <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't specify male or female, right? He just says, like, mm -hmm. dragons can go a month without eating. So, like, we're just making the assumption that it's yeah. likely the female? Okay. That's what yeah. makes me think it's like ubiquitous and it's just there's like a yeah. maybe they evolved through like a period where there was like cold months or like I mean there's yeah. winter so maybe there's dragons winter. normally like hibernate through winter. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that would also make sense because then you could like be building the egg during the winter and yeah. it does say that like the egg waits to hatch until conditions are favorable. Which they say, like, in the wild is when there's enough food. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. like, the female spends the winter building eggs and, like, laying them whenever she's done building them or something, depending on how long it takes. And then they hatch in the spring when the conditions are satisfactory. Yeah, and that would kind of make sense because then if mating season was in the fall before they had to hibernate, it would mean mm -hmm. they would have to, like, eat a lot. Yeah. <laughs> to get... <laughs> Get. Like fat bear season or fat yeah. bear week, but fat, fat dragon week. <laughs> fat dragon yeah. week. Oh, Aww. Aww. <laughs> just a <laughs> bunch of chonkers struggling to yeah. fly. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's fun. I mean, from an ecological standpoint, it also makes sense that these things aren't eating that often because, like, can you just imagine how much food a horde of dragons would go through? And yeah. like, they would just eat so much. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's they're like, which is massive apex predators, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. But like imagine an army of like I don't know, what's a reasonable amount of dragons? But like if at, at the <laughs> peak of the riders, they would have had like hundreds. This is actually a problem I thought of in like every fantasy book I read with dragons <laughs> is how how do you keep enough food for these dragons? Because like you can barely well yeah farmers. Every that's the thing needs more farmers but even then like if you think of them as in the wild right like again yeah. if we equate them to like dinosaurs like the largest yeah. dinosaurs that were predators existed in an ecosystem of other giant prey animals yeah and there exactly. were tons of them so exactly like, like, what are the dragons eating without anything else around? Did everything else go yeah. extinct when the elves showed up? I guess, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe there are some, like, native megafauna that just don't live in the spine. Like, they get to this humongous grassland at the end of the second chapter, which is... Empty. <laughs> yeah, but still, yeah. like, those giant grasslands in the real world, I guess, are... Giant grasslands like that tend to support large groups of large herbivores, right? Like, if you yeah. look at North America before white people showed up, or, yeah. like, mm -hmm. Africa. <laughs> there are a lot of, like, huge grazing herds. Even, like, the tundra. Yeah. There's, like, caribou all over the place up there. That's yeah, true. which leads me to believe that, like, because one of the main things that happened in North America was, like, well, even just, like, before... Like the white people colonizers arrived. showed up from over the sea and killed everything. Yeah, it was like as soon as humans started developing like spears, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. like mass extinctions of megafauna. Although yeah. I know we don't have more than ten listeners, but uh, no one call me out. I know that the it was compounded by a number of factors, <laughs> not just humans <laughs> with spears, yeah. but they were part of the problem. Uh -huh. Yep. So, like, it could conceivably, yeah, have happened in Allegasia. Like, the elves showed up and, like, actually maybe hunted a bunch of stuff to extinction. Yeah. yeah I'd maybe. believe it. I just don't think dragon books fully consider this enough. And, like, it's one of the <laughs> things I really thought about when I read Flamefall and Fireborn by Rosaria mm. Munda. I said those out of order, but the whole, like, <laughs> main thing of it is, like, they're going through... Uh, famine and i'm like how the f are all of these dragons okay i'm just yeah. like like you barely have enough food to feed humans i'm like how is like what <laughs> what mean, are the, the dragons, dragons eating the dragons are even above the gold bands they get as many rations as they want yeah it's just like i don't think authors think of this enough and i like paulini himself just like grazes over the husbandry of a dragon and i'm just like yeah, okay, it eats once a month, but what is it eating? And it's gotta be a big meal if it's only Like, yeah, is it, like, 50 goats? Is it one <laughs> goat? <laughs> is it a giraffe? Each dragon eats one mastodon per six months of life. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm just saying. Yeah. So Mercedes Lackey. Yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thinks about this. Anyway, uh... <laughs> I want to talk about eggs still, okay. uh, <laughs> which is specifically, I want to talk about the point that the eggs are laid fully ready to go. Yeah. Which is like kind of the opposite almost of ovo viviparous animals yeah. like sharks, where mm -hmm. the young develop in an egg, which is the ovo part, but the egg stays in the mother's body and like hatches within the mother's body. And then the baby sharks come out of her cloaca, so it looks like they're giving live birth, which is the viva part. But that's where, like, the egg stays in the body until it's ready to hatch, not the egg comes out of the body when it's ready to hatch. And I can't think of any examples of a creature that uses eggs that keeps the egg inside until it's ready to hatch and then lays it. Do either of you know of any examples of real no. things that do that? I, I mean, I'm sure like could hatch like the instant it was i guess like there's probably either a fish or an insect that can do it like within a day probably yeah that's true um... gotta be or even like i guess external fertilizers a lot of the time don't they have very short 
I don't know what the word for gestation is when it's just in an egg, but that, like, the egg and sperm meet in the environment, and then they become a coral yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but they, like, if your definition is, like, comes out ready to hatch. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely not <laughs> true. <laughs> I'm like, are tur- turtles rely on temperature before they hatch, or that determines mm-hmm. whether they their sex. Yeah. But... But they have no. to like hang out in the sand for a while. Yeah, I'm that's why I was like, I don't turtles. think I don't think they're a good example. There's, I don't I'm sure there is so. one, but I don't know what it is. Because wouldn't it be too energetically costly to like fully develop this thing and then pop out the egg? Like, what yeah. would be the like? There would be no evolutionary advantage to exerting that much energy into developing it internally and then laying that egg like, fully ready to go, you know? Dang. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I feel like the only thing that I can think of that makes sense is what we've touched on before, that maybe the females develop the eggs during a period where, for whatever reason, they can't do anything else, so it's easy to direct all of their energy into making an egg. But then, yeah. for whatever reason that is, the egg does not... Or it's not good to have a baby dragon hatch out at that time, so it's good for the egg to, like, be protected until the instant that it can hatch safely. Yeah. But that, like, again, raises a lot of questions. Maybe baby dragons are, like, real sharp. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, like, they have these serrated claws. They've got spines oh. all down their back that, like, she had from oh, birth. Oh, good point. So, like, maybe the egg is laid so that it doesn't, like, damage the mother. That's a good yeah. point. You would assume that if the yeah, if they were to have live birth, then the female cloaca would like somehow be adapted to that. But that is an excellent. I feel like popping out an egg is a lot more safe. Yeah, yeah, but also like yeah. that is a thing that exists <laughs> in nature, right? Like if you've ever seen a picture of a newborn horse's feet, they are absolutely horrifying. Because they're like covered in this like weird, yeah, uh, eponych. I think it's called eponychium, but it's like a soft layer around the hoof so that it doesn't damage the mother during birth. So like, yeah, there are things that exist where just the dangerous parts of the baby are protected, which again is less energetically expensive. Or you could just, I guess, reptiles are not like placental animals, but you could have like a sack <laughs> around something that would be. <laughs> I don't know, tough when it's wet, but as soon as it dries out, it cracks or whatever, so that, like, when the baby is born, it can come out of its sack, like a placenta, but not. Yeah. And that would also probably be less ener- energetically expensive than laying down all of these, like, <laughs> thick layers of some kind of biogenic marble, yeah. like, but like Saphir's egg. But, That's like, what, yeah. the thing is, is they're, they're already, right, like, they're already laying down the egg because they are reptilian, right? Like, right. They aren't part of a fan. Like, it's not that they have moved beyond egg and then their species has developed these pointy bits. Right. Right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like they are an egg layer where the babies are, like, pointy. And okay. so they're already forming the egg inside. True. Yeah. Right? But then what's the benefit in keeping the egg inside until it's full development rather than just laying it like a regular... Yeah, Yeah. because you would assume inside the egg has all nutritional whatever is needed to fully develop. So what's... Unless... Unless? Unless there's, like, some sort of, like, attachment, like, Uh from... Like a placenta. (laughs) Yeah, basically the egg is, like, a glorified placenta, and then when it's fully done, that detaches somehow internally, and then the egg pops out, and it's just, like, waiting for its dragon rider. Which leads me to another question, but we'll go into that after this discussion. I still feel like it would just be so costly to just have, like, a full egg, like, in you that's basically stone yeah. because everyone thought this was a rock. And then, like, yeah, the main purpose would be protection. That makes sense. But I don't really understand anything else besides that. Like, I don't see any other benefit of having this egg fully develop and then lay it and then it just sits there fully developed, ready to go. <laughs> Maybe the egg itself is not energetically expensive because, okay, here's my thought. I don't know if I'm going to articulate it correctly, (laughs) but 
my conclusion, I don't know if we accepted it, but the conclusion I came to was that the eggs are some kind of like calcium carbonate, which is like pretty standard for like eggs and shells and things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And presumably these gigantic dragons that eat a lot of food would also be eating the bones. Yeah. Maybe instead of digesting yeah. the bones or like grinding them up in a gizzard or something, they got all that like calcium carbonate mm. or calcium rather from the bones Smart, yes. into their body and the way that like the female dragons at least get rid of that excess calcium is by putting it into the eggshell. Yeah. So like yeah. It might, the, the egg itself might not be that energe- energetically expensive if we assume that dragons eat a lot of bones and uh, producing an eggshell is less energy intensive than what other or whatever other excretory measures they might have to get rid of that excess <laughs> yeah. calcium. Yeah. That My makes sense. The only counter oh. to that though is that like calcium carbonate is kind of not brittle but like can be yeah. and isn't it's described like a stone, right? Like Yeah, but different like limestone yeah. and marble are calcium carbonate just in a That's different true. form. That's true. That's true. All right. So it's still not, like, strong, because limestone and marble are both, like, pretty soft as far as rocks go. Yeah. Yeah. But still. I buy that. I mean, they could also be, like, you know, just chowing down on, you know, like, birds go and, like, eat some weird rocks when they're, (laughs) like, lacking in certain nutrients. So, like, there could just be a period of time where, like, dragons go and, like, eat rocks. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. All right. <laughs> like yeah. I buy it. They go eat clay or something from the riverbank. Mm-hmm. I did also just want to say because I was thinking about it. Mm-hmm. It could be that like we've seen that a baby dragon is like very high needs in terms of food, mm-hmm. and I looked up ovo viviparity, and in some cases the baby the egg is like totally isolated, and the baby just like relies on yolk but in other cases the baby will like finish the yolk but in the egg (laughs) still be getting nutrients from the parent right so it could be that like it is just less energetically expensive for the mother to be eating (laughs) and feeding the baby inside rather than like (laughs) having to go hunt for a starving baby dragon yeah yeah okay fair the only issue with that is that the dragon eggs are indefinitely viable once they leave the mother's body. Yeah. Right. And that we're just assuming That's is magic. magic. It's yeah. Magic. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. But that maybe that could be part of it that like maybe the ba- baby dragons Oh no, never mind. I was going to say maybe the baby dragons take so much energy from the mother that it's easier to just lay the egg and have them sit there for a while before they actually hatch. But then that would promote the dragons being laid before they're fully formed and ready to go. So I don't think that's actually a good idea. No. I have another question about the eggs. Sure. Okay. So we get that they either hatch by finding their rider or if like conditions are right, like if there's a lot of food available. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how does a dragon egg know there's a lot of food available because this is something more common in an aquatic ecosystem because they can sense the amount of phytoplankton or zooplankton in the water and they know, oh, good food. What would be a food indicator to tell a dragon to hatch in a terrestrial environment? I would like to know. Maybe some sound cue? I think brain? it's sound. brain magic with other yeah, dragons. magic. <laughs> I didn't want it to be well, brain magic. They can... You, they can talk to the baby, right? Didn't they? Didn't I we think ta- so. Didn't they say that somewhere? They that like the, the baby the hatches. No, sorry. I said that I thought the baby learned language inside the egg because that happened in a different dragon book, and I couldn't remember oh. if it also happened mm. in this one or not. Okay. I felt like it did, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. They're like they're able to sense outside of the egg somehow. True. Because like they, we know they have some extra extra ovum (laughs) sensory (laughs) capabilities because of the way that they hatch yeah but he didn't say what which sense extends beyond the egg i feel like it's got to be hearing maybe they like hear birds or like they hear a migration of wildebeest or something okay but no because they like (laughs) they hatch they hatch for they hatch for specifically their rider 
which yeah. is brain magic. Brain yes. right? for sure. Like yeah. they sense the thoughts of the person, which means that what happens for normal times is like the mother probably is like, hey, it's a good time. <laughs> to oh. Hatch. Right? Yeah. It might be like part of the dragon brain magic that they can just sense living beings around them. Yeah. And maybe it's like the baby dragon senses there is a lot more life around me than there was before. So now it's okay to come out. They need such like a wide range though. That's what I mean. It's like, how mm, do you, like you would have to be able to sense, I don't even know how big of a an area, but it's like yeah. the amount of food that a newborn dragon would need like, how would a dragon know there's enough food at that point? It's like, oh, it's a good time to hatch. What if it's, like, a herd of something ran by and then it hatched the next day, but oops, True. the herd was gone. Good point. I Did we... Know. I can't remember because it has been a while since we started this book. <laughs> was Zephyr relatively, like, self-sufficient from the moment yeah. she hatched? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that implies that there is very little parental care. Yes, yeah. At least once the egg has been laid. But I mean, she got a lot of, she needed help from Aragon. She just didn't need help hunting. Right. Yeah. Right? No, I don't think so. Mm. But also, like, how long does an egg wait until it gives up on finding its dragon rider? Like. I think <laughs> I remember that there's some kind of magic that they do on the eggs that are given to be dragons for riders. Oh. Okay, I have two very important thoughts here. Okay. <laughs> the first one is. <laughs> That, like, what Sam said, like, how long do they wait? Yeah. Because Aragon <laughs> has this, like, Aragon has this very, like, heartfelt moment where he's like, wow, I'm honored that of all the people in Allegasia, she chose me. And I'm sitting there being like, you're the first person she met that was yeah. from, like, these fucking elves. <laughs> so it's like, well, did yeah. she or did she just go, all right, good enough? <laughs> did she just go, I don't want an elf, so here's a human, good here's enough? A- yeah, best possible choice. <laughs> but guys, guys, Aragon is the chosen one. Yeah, of course it was very special. Yes. I feel like at some point there's got to be a conversation of like, why did you pick me? But I don't know if that's even going to be in this book. Yeah. Um, so. fair. My second thought mm-hmm. yep. was like, okay, what the fuck? They just, <laughs> these dragons just sell their children? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> like... Like, like the sentence is—it's like an arranged w- marriage. It's not that weird. <laughs> like, huh, the sentence is: once they formed an alliance with the elves, a certain number of their eggs, usually no more than one or two, were given to the riders each year. Like, not even implied that, like, oh, the baby dragons choose. You know, it's just like, no, you guys are going to be, it's these ones. sorry, <laughs> you guys are going to be, um, dragon elf friends. It's just like a, it's like a sacrifice. Like, that's yeah. what it feels like. I feel yeah. like it's more related to the fact that the elves and dragons both like, quote unquote, sacrifice one or two of their young to the dragon yeah. riders, which is sure. an organization made up of both. It's yeah. not like the elves are the superior party. It's yeah. that, like, it's the two cultures working together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True. Which I think makes it less weird, but mm-hmm. that might not be... You might be biased. A popular opinion. <laughs> <laughs> True. No, I don't I, know. I also don't think it's, like, that weird to, like, not ask an infant for consent before <laughs> placing it with a family. Because that's a thing yeah, that fair. happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I just... It's just weird because it's, like... I give them to not our species. But then, <laughs> anyway. like, how do you pick which two it is? And then do the yeah. two that get picked are resentful that they don't get to live with the rest of the wild dragons? Right. And, like, I feel like that's a whole story right there. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's got to be the same for the elves, though, right? Like, it's the same deal. Yeah. Wait, the they elves? just don't talk about it in this specific. <laughs> but wait, it's wait, probably. Wait, 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 what? The elves give like... two elves to the dragons? What? No, the elves give two elves to be dragon riders, right? Yeah, but... Each baby dragon needs a, someone to ride on it. I mean, they're, I guess they're not giving human babies to dragon babies, because that would be a nightmare. That's what but I'm that's... saying, right? Yeah, yeah. That's... but like, uh, but they're dragon riders. They're still participating in their own society. They're still like elves. They're still experiencing their own culture, their own everything. But the dragons like, are just no, like... No, because the, the dragon riders were separate. They were their own culture. 
Oh, are they? Like they it is taken it does take a lot from the elf elvish culture. Oh. But like the dragon riders are like a separate organization. Yeah, I guess oh, like oh, I see your point. Yeah, now like that okay, these two elves have to leave their culture and go. Yeah. But like it does kind of feel like they are adults who have been training for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or, like, at yeah. least, like, teens who have been training for this. Yeah, yes. so they, like, mentally know what they're getting into. Or, like, if there's several trains and only two go, like, if there's people who don't want to go, then they probably have the yeah. way out. Yeah, I mean, I totally get where you're coming from. I don't think it's yeah that weird. But also, yeah. uh, part of that is also, I think, because the evidence we have so far implies that there's, like, very little parental or familial care in dragons. Yeah. It's probably less of like, I don't know, like a community based culture. Yeah. You know? Oh, but now I want to know. I want to know. I'm very curious <laughs> about yeah. how the wild dragons are and how they communicate and how their societies work. I need this in my life. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the wild dragons are uh, quote unquote savage, which is a whole problematic other thing that we'll get oh. to when it comes up. Oh. <laughs> oh. But, you know. Uh, that's okay. fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Well, I have another thing we can talk. About. I was gonna say. Yeah, please. Yeah, me too. Well, it's only sort of related. I want to talk about <laughs> how dragons mate. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Because <laughs> we didn't talk about it yet. We did skirt around the fact. We, we skirted, skirted around it down. so that yeah. we don't have to censor this whole episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Um, but listen, I'll be very polite about it because <laughs> this is like. A big thing that people wonder about dinosaurs too, right? Like, how yeah. the hell did an 100 foot long, like, sauropod <laughs> mate with another 100 foot long sauropod? I-, I want to know. Yeah, without like crushing it. <laughs> I need to know this information. So, um, I just like as a sidebar, which I didn't know, they actually couldn't figure out a way how to tell like male and female dinosaurs apart. Like oh. as fossils because like oh. soft tissue so rarely yeah. fossilizes, and there are no like super obvious like crests or like whatever that are like only on males and not on females or whatever. So finally, like the way that only recently they figured it out is they still can only figure out if it's a female if it has recently laid eggs, because oh. birds and dinosaurs both lay down this like extra layer of like material on their bones when they're building eggs oh and so that was the only way they were able to tell if something was a female dinosaur is if they had that on their bones wow (laughs) yeah (laughs) there's no like difference in bone structure like in the like hip region at all no not that's like super obvious yeah i guess i mean the eggs are small proportional to the body so yeah true and it's also hard because like yeah, a lot of fossils get like deformed when they're being yeah. like created. So like when <laughs> yeah. they're being fossilized. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out when something dies 65 million years ago, it gets like smushed around a bit. Who would have thought? <laughs> In between. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but so like there are some theories out there and it probably like varies based on species. So like I don't know. Uh, most of them, like T Rex, is probably the way you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but, yeah, um... I'm kind of assuming that dragons, like <laughs> reptiles and birds, have cloacas. Yeah, that's well, kind of what I'm working on. I Me mean, too. so a lot. So there are birds and crocodilians have like external genitalia. Mm-hmm. Did not know that. Yeah, and so the birds that have it are like more basal. In, evo- oh, okay. in like the evolutionary tree so it is thought that dinosaurs probably had external genitalia and not just like a cloaca but i just want to say before you continue <laughs> on to say something very intelligent uh-huh. the idea of a dong on something the size of a sauropod just makes me yeah. so Thank unhappy you. uh-huh i <laughs> really what hate I was that thinking too. <laughs> now you have to think about it for the rest of the time that i'm talking Oh, please proceed with the intelligent thoughts with as my I die laughing. Intelligent laugh science while you yeah. think about yeah. giant dinosaur dicks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so like sauropods. Really unpleasant. Yeah. So they all probably, like, maybe they had cloacas if they were like the theropod mm-hmm. lineage. So like the ones that are running around on their two legs, like mm-hmm. birds. The mm-hmm. bird ones. 
but it's likely that like a lot of them had external genitalia also because just from a logistical standpoint yeah. it makes it a lot easier <laughs> yeah i mean i guess if you like whales right like whales have those uh-huh. very long prehensile yeah things things that they use because they're very big <laughs> Dorks. yep and don't have like hands or anything yeah they there just kind is... of roll around up there. <laughs> there there is a thought that like t-rex's tiny arms are literally just for like holding on no really yep uh-huh i mean i guess if you're a t-rex you I can't got... really use your mouth yeah well because like there's some Sharks snakes do. that just have little hooks left over <laughs> just for holding on yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> There's a fun either. fact. Oh god. Yep. Little snake <laughs> arms just for fucking. No, no, it's their back legs. They just got I little hooks. Myself. They got little snake <laughs> legs. I can't believe Sam muted herself while she was laughing for this. <laughs> That's so rude. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I'm talking about it if not to make you embarrass yourself? <laughs> oh my god, the visuals in my head right now, yeah. like I, I can't, oh, I can't draw, but like, oh my I, god, right, if I can draw this. <laughs> I'm imagining the snake comic specifically. Yeah, <laughs> that's just like nice legs. Thanks, they're for sex. <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, between like the tiny arms and the mm-hmm. external genitalia like i'm mm-hmm. you're just you having a good time over there it's bigger than its arms yeah <laughs> it would have to be it can't get much smaller quite honestly <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> has <true>. to be <laughs> wow so anyway i'm a child <laughs> none of my professional colleagues can ever find this just this yeah, one I was, episode i was <laughs> Uh, invited to like a team building thing and I was like oh no I have plans and they asked me what my plans were and you were like pass <laughs> no I unlike you I have no qualms talking about our podcast so I was like oh yeah I'm doing a podcast and they asked me what it was about so I was like oh we use our biology degrees to like talk about YA books yeah yeah and at the time I didn't really think it was a bad idea but I'm starting to question that decision <laughs> it's okay as long as you don't bring it up uh sometime in january again yeah just like <laughs> skip this what's your podcast called hmm? what podcast what podcast i it was canceled and deleted off the internet don't worry yeah. about it oh no that was a joke i that lied i joke actually had I to water my hair yeah <laughs> i left my laundry in the oven sorry <laughs> oh uh, i had I'm to deceased. vacuum my cat <laughs> yeah this, anyway um yeah. This, now that Sam's recovered, let's talk about it some more. <laughs> so, th- for a, a while, they thought that the sauropods, like, they were like, they couldn't have made it the way everyone thinks, <laughs> because if one was, like, on top of the other one, it would crush it. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> but also, quite recently, people did, like, biophysics studies, I guess, where they were like actually Modeling. like yeah you know stuff <laughs> and like if a creature is a four-legged creature is like walking mm-hmm. normally between every step its entire body weight is only on two legs mm-hmm. so they're like by that logic it can yeah. hold twice oh, its own weight yeah. Yeah. Well, they have tails like kangaroos. Maybe they could balance. Nope. No. Oh, uh-huh. no. <laughs> uh-huh. no. Oh, no. Yep. Are you imagining old timey long neck dinosaurs? Pro- yeah, I no. don't know. Probably. <laughs> like yeah, the lines before time ones? <laughs> yeah. These ones are like, hor- like they're like a horizontal line. <laughs> yeah, but if they have to tilt in order to. They just tilt on. <laughs> They just tilt. <laughs> they tilt onto the tail. <laughs> they just. The, why would they be? T- why would they be tilting back onto the tail? <laughs> because they have to tilt up to get over whoever oh, they're mating. The, the one that's on top. I thought you were talking about the one on the bottom. I was like, that's why not... would I be talking about the one on the bottom if we're talking that's about the one, the one that has to stand on two legs? No, no, no. Wait, wait, the one on the what? bottom has to hold all the weight. The one. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking the yeah, one yeah. on the top puts most of its weight in its back legs. Yes. Like a bear does. It, when it's yes, standing. it would also they have were, to do that. Yeah, they were worried about the one on the bottom, though, being smooshed. Yeah. smooshed. yeah, but when you said they could support their body weight on two legs. 
Right. I they... was thinking about the one on the top. Yes. Which also a fair point. It's got to be on two legs. Also going... reasonable. I think they just swing one leg over. But anyway. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Do they each? The one that's in the way. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> that's a visual I didn't know. I was capable of imagining. There you go. The, now you the, are. Literally, the visuals in my head right now are just yeah wild. So the next thing I want you to imagine is a kentrosaurus. What's a kentrosaurus? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> my, so I, my dinosaur so... knowledge is Jurassic Park and Land Before Time. So <laughs> me too. So a kentrosaurus is like a stegosaurus, except instead of plates, it just has spikes. Oh, and then okay. it has and then it has bonus spikes like if you imagine the spot that would be like the most terrifying if you were trying to mate uh, with one like, uh, <laughs> like side uh, <laughs> and tail I was definitely thinking around the b- <laughs> uh, Yeah anyway um so that's where they have extra spikes Do I have to bleep b- probably Is this like hmm. ducks <laughs> <laughs> no, so for them, oh god, the theory for them and stegosaurs, <laughs> the idea is that they probably just had to lay down on their side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> scissoring, dino scissoring, or alternately, like a butt to butt situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I kind of like that one. Like when right? a dog, go- when a dog stands between your legs and like demands you scratch its butt and like wiggles, yeah. just yeah. <laughs> But two. <laughs> yeah. So those are all the important parts of dinosaur mating that you need to know about. I really like the idea that they decide they want to mate and then they have to just not look at each other and turn around. Yeah. I like the butt to butt. Because <laughs> I'm imagining exactly what Hannah said. Like, just like yeah. two really awkward dinosaurs who just like don't really know how to start it. So they're just like. Like, they're just, like, wiggling their butt because they're like, yeah, you wanna? You wanna? And the other's like, yeah, I wanna? It's just, like, a lot of butt wiggles. Anyways, and I'm- they just have to, like, back into each other just, like, with the truck backing up noise. Like, bing, yeah. Bing, bing. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, it's just, I- like, boop! I was like picturing the motion and I'm like, where have I seen this before that I can like imagine it so vividly? And it's all those videos of turtles getting like really hyped to have the back of their shell scratched. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the back and visual. Forth. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's that. We used to work with a sea turtle. Yeah, and so when she would come and she'd, she'd finish her food and then she'd put your, her butt in our face and then you're like, okay, yeah. here's your okay. shell scratches. But we yeah. definitely didn't because it's you're not supposed to. No, Wait. we never did that. So oh, we did for legal that. reasons. This is a joke. <laughs> anyway, yep. Mm-hmm. That's so. One of those is probably how dragons have sex. <laughs> that was like the best, legit. Like because they're so spiky. Yeah, it's probably like a situation like the kentrosaur. Like they might just the have to lie to down. Side. Yeah, or, which I think is kind of butt. sweet. The side to side one is just it's just kind of sweet. Can you just Yeah, because you have to hug while you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. So just like you just imagine like two dragons on their side, like looking lovingly into each other's eyes while and they do the nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> this episode is rated M. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah this is I, I mean, we never actually discussed being quote unquote family friendly, and I feel like we have officially let that ship sail. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It I went. mean, we probably did now. that when we talked about Edward's, but. We did, yes. <laughs> Anyways. Anyway, uh... I kind of wanted to talk about the saddle. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about the saddle. Yeah, uh, to get away from sex for a minute, let's talk about some leather straps. Um, Great segue. Thanks. <laughs> the mate, I was going to go into a little more detail, but I think this podcast has gone on for long enough. So I just have one thing that I was having difficulty imagining. So I'm curious what you guys have to say. Sure. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to read a short passage just to like give the context, mm-hmm. which is that there was like the main part of the saddle attached to the front was a thick loop that would fit snugly around one of Saphira's neck spikes. Bands on either side would wrap around her belly and tie underneath. And then a long strap was constructed to pass between Saphira's front legs, split in two, and then come up behind her front legs to rejoin with the saddle. 
I cannot figure out the construction of that. Where are they starting? I, no, I assumed it it came off of the neck band, off of the neck band. Yeah, yeah, and then like went down sternum, down between her legs and like up under her armpits. Yeah, mm. just to keep the like, because I imagine right, like I'm assuming they have like long necks. Right? I assume so, yeah. yeah. And so I assume it needs, like, so the loop doesn't, like, slide up and down. Mm-hmm. They need, like, the band at the front, like, at the front of it to go, like, connect it across the sternum so that it, like, stays in place. Right. Okay. For some reason, I was I was stuck on the idea that this, like, leg strap was coming from the main part of the saddle, not, like, the neck strap. Oh. And I was having such a difficult time imagining <laughs> how, like, one strap would come from the saddle, go across her sternum, and then come back up under her arms. And I was it like, goes, how? Straight up the back <laughs> of her neck, over her nose, and then down Like, the does front. it go to, like, one side? Like, does it go behind her leg and then loop around behind her leg again? Like, what the f- Yeah. <laughs> but that makes way more sense. You can tell that I was reading this at work on my lunch break because I have thrown a hurricane of time management on my life and it was the only time I had to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> okay, that makes way more sense. And now I, I can imagine so. it better. See, this yeah. is it's a pretty example. cool idea for a saddle. Yeah. I don't really get the part where it, like, hooks over one of her spines. I think that's to, like, place it, right? So that it doesn't, like, slide side to side. Yeah, I guess so. Hmm. I don't know. I read this passage and it's a perfect example of one where I was just like, yeah, that sounds right. And kept going. (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny because it does, it does feel like, like as someone who has fully over engineered (laughs) random items in books, like this feels like something that Christopher Paolini thought about for weeks. Like yeah, he was like, how does the saddle make sense? And then he's like, well, because if you don't, if it's just there without the neck spine part, then like it'll slide side to side. So you have to add something to connect it to the spine, and then you have to have the one through the sternum so it doesn't slide up and down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he probably did exactly that. And then me as yeah. the reader was just like, I don't sure. care. <laughs> you could have yeah. just said there's one strap around the middle, and I would have been like, yep, yep. I'm yeah, just like, yeah, well. Sure. Great. Well, us specifically. Yeah, I was like, us specifically, no. Would have been but. like, no. Yeah. <laughs> but you two. Don't tell else. me so much about the saddle. Tell me more about uh, how they made. I <laughs> narrowed in on the mating and the husbandry. <laughs> I was just like, that is what I want to know. Saddles. I'm like, me. Yeah. But on the note of saddles, I will say okay. the fact that Aragon did not even think to sit side saddle while his thighs are still. Utterly destroyed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's a like, man. My dude. Side just, just, just ride side saddle. Can also that Absolutely he's never not. ridden a horse before. Yeah. Also that. <laughs> and they were especially because the horse that they bought for Aragon, the guy selling it specifically said like, "Oh, this horse is very spirited, but he just needs a firm hand." And I'm like, "Cool, so give him to the kid who's never ridden a horse before. I'm sure that'll right? work out great." Because of course, the chosen one just knows how to ride a horse. That's true. Obviously. He does instinctively know how to reach out and touch his, touch the horse's mind like he does with Sephira. Which Brahm was like, wow, that's unusual for you to be able to do that. So. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. <laughs> Aragorn just has magic now. <laughs> he just, he is magic. Wow. Wow. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that the horses are, quote, so much smaller than Sephira, which means Sephira is a lot bigger than I thought. Yeah. The last yeah. time I did the math about her. Yeah. So very quickly, the average height of a horse, which is like such a broad classification because there's so many yeah. kinds of horses, but the average height of a horse at the shoulder is about 1.63 meters or five foot three inches, which means that Sephira is much larger than that. Whatever. So probably that means. like three times higher. And like at least twice as tall, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, she's got to be at least, like, three meters at the shoulder now then, right? Damn. Right? Big? And she she can't carry Brom and Aragon? <laughs> okay. I don't know. I mean, a horse can carry two people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess a horse doesn't have to fly. <laughs> yeah. I feel like she should be able to carry both of them, but alas. Maybe if she was, like, walking, it would be okay, but she can't yeah. fly because 
she's too young and flying is so energetically expensive. So if you bad, are bro. doing a drinking game with this podcast for the Aragon chapters, just take energetically expensive off your list. We don't want to yeah. be responsible for that. You'll probably <laughs> die. <laughs> Specifically, Hannah has said it a lot today. <laughs> it, I got it in my head and it's the only thing I yeah. can think of to say. Yeah. What I want to say. It's useful. It's a good phrase. It makes yeah. me feel smart when I say it. <laughs> it's a very smart phrase. Do we want to guess what happens next time? Oh, yeah. These, oh, yeah. these chapters are, these chapter titles are wild. So <laughs> <laughs> the next chapter is called Thunder Roar and Lightning Crackle. Very, oh very frightening. And then the next <laughs> one is called Revelation at Yazuak. What the f- so Yasuak yeah. is a place? Uh, yeah. Mark, I guess so. Or a palace. Something happens. Yeah. Which is still a place. It's a proper noun of some kind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, okay, they're gonna get caught in a Yeah, they're gonna get caught in a storm. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like either the Shade or the Razak or the Urgles are gonna, like, attack them. Probably the Razak, but who knows? Because, like, creatures just keep coming up out of nowhere. Yeah, it's gonna be some new creature we haven't seen yet. Yeah. yeah. A fourth new one. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then revelations. He, I, f- are we gonna get like some like history on his chosen one arc, maybe, or like Brahm's revelation? It's yeah, it's something about Brahm. Yeah. Oh, right? okay. So maybe we'll get like a history of Brahm and like why he knows so much and yeah, what stuff? could it possibly be? <laughs> what could I it wonder. Be? I have no idea, but he can just make a saddle. <laughs> it's true. It could also be, um, because it was specifically brought up in this chapter, but we didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Aragon asks for the second time who the rider was who had his sword, oh, the yeah. red sword Zarak, before Aragon. Yeah, and Brahm is like, Aragon. I refuse to tell you. Because yeah. it was Aragon. Maybe. It was so maybe Aragon. he finds out whose sword it was. I bet $100 it was Aragon. Wow, that's that a lot bet. of money. <laughs> <laughs> it was Aragon. I actually have this highlighted on like my copy and i said <laughs> i bet you it's aragon <laughs> i bet you that's his name anyways anyway it could be about the sword cool that's, is all i'm saying <laughs> those yeah. are some good guesses yeah yeah i guess we'll find out uh, next time wow <gasps> wow yeah i guess let's talk about what else we're reading i don't remember what books i finished for the last episode <laughs> <Same>. but <laughs> I think I finished City of Brass between and it was very good and I just got the audiobook for the second book and I'm very excited. Nice. And then I powered through two books that I have been reading for a very long time and hadn't finished. So I finally finished Blackfish City. It was a very good ending. It was a good book. I would recommend it. And just, I would just recommend powering through it. <laughs> it's very good though. And then I finished Watership Down, our hey. October book. Oh, nice. Yeah, I liked it Wasn't a lot. Wasn't it amazing? It was a best great book. book. Ever, right? It was the best book ever, is exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> no, I really liked it actually. It's a good animal book. Yeah. It is a good animal book. I was expecting it to be way more gory because of what yeah. I'd heard about this book. And uh, I was like, it actually like is pretty The chill. movie is kind of gory. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the way a lot of the stuff in Ephrafa is portrayed in the movie, and I think especially the Black Rabbit, are, like, yeah. a little spooky. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I liked it. It's so good. And that's... <laughs> Am I currently reading anything? I don't think so. Shorefall. Wow. I'm currently reading Shorefall. Hey. There you yeah, go. Yeah, that's a good one. What about you guys? Okay, I also don't remember, like, what the last thing I was reading when we recorded but I've either finished eight or nine books since then. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So let's just do speed round here. Um, if you'd like yeah. a good indigenous read, check out The Removed by Brandon Hobson or Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Both five out of five. Love that. If you want a romance book, I read You Had Me at Ola by Alexis Daria, Payback's A Witch by Lana Harper, uh, and Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade. All great love. Go read them. And then I read Daisy Jones and the Six, also fantastic. I finally finished the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle, but I DNF'd <laughs> wow. it and just add my I DNF'd it and just asked my boyfriend to explain to me what happened because like <laughs> I couldn't. He finished it. I just like gave I just did not care. Like it's just no. 
And then lastly, I read Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men, which is extremely infuriating, made me very angry, but a good book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I am currently reading The Dating Plan by Sarah Desi, and I'm behind on our uh, book club, so I'm only getting to the 10,000 Doors of January now, which is ironic because this book will come out in Jan- or not this book, this episode- <laughs> Will come, come out in, in January. January. <laughs> perfect, perfect wow. time to read it. Cool. Speed round done. There we go. Anyways, can you tell? Can you tell that Sam's boyfriend has been gone for like? Three weeks? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. I will say, I think uh-huh. all of those were audiobooks. As for me, I don't really re- again remember what I talked about last time we were here. But as I mentioned, I've dumped a hurricane on my life and don't really have a ton of time to read. So I think last time I mentioned that I had just gotten Kenobi by John Jackson Miller, which I am still currently reading as a (laughs) recording. It's really good. It is, I would say, one of the better Star Wars books that I've read. Nice. It's very entertaining. I listened to Shorefall, um, same as Sophie, and I just started listening to How to Be an F1 Driver, My Guide to Life in the Fast Lane by... (laughs) Formula One world champion, Jensen Button. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love Which it. Which is very entertaining so far. Yeah. Is it a memoir or is it like actually how to be an F1 driver? No, it, it's sort of like, yeah, like a memoir or an autobiography about like okay. how he got into the sport and how it was for him. Okay, cool. Yeah, but he does do it in the, the vein of like, here are some things I learned about like how to be a Formula One driver. Like, yeah, okay. be a selfish bastard, and then he like talks about how that applies to him. <laughs> right, gotcha. <laughs> Just a little tongue in cheek. Yes, quite tongue in cheek. Great. He even says at the beginning, he's like, "Yeah, I wanted to write this, but I didn't want it to be boring, so I tried to make it as quirky as possible." Ah, <laughs> I was like, "That's wholesome. That's fun. Yeah, that's fun. Very uh, <laughs> on brand <laughs> for what I am <laughs> into at the moment." But anyway, oh, I should say if this book, if this book. Sam, <laughs> uh, this episode is coming out in January of 2022 when we will be reading Ooh. The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed for our Midnight Book Club. So yeah, Yay. follow along with that if you want. I'm excited about that one. I've heard it's really good. Me too. All right. And with all of that out of the way and not thinking about dinosaur dongs anymore. <laughs> I still am. It, uh, <laughs> If you liked this chapter of Midlight Crisis, liked, liked, maybe uh-huh. a strong word. Love. If you liked it, consider rating and reviewing us positively, I hope, on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. You can talk to us and find fun, non-dong related content on social media. <laughs> we are at Midlight Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And all chapters of the show thus far are available on our website, midlightpod.podbean.com and on YouTube. And as we've all learned in the past two years, you can't argue with all of the fools in the world. It's easier to let them have their way than trick them when they're not paying attention. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If only it weren't so true. (laughs) So, so true. Oh, man. You know what's great? Seeing women go on Tinder and making men get vaccinated so that they'll go on dates with them and then she ghosts (laughs) them. Oh my god, what? I need to do this. I have so much respect for those women. (laughs) This is the most powerful catfishing. Right? Wow.